25 years ago, as my beloved and I were planning our wedding, we realized that no amount of flowers, food, or fizz would disguise the embarrassing fact that we did not know how to dance. We imagined everyone we knew watching us alone on the dance floor, shuffling our way through the eighth grade sway for the duration of an entire song, or worse, maybe moshing. We immediately enrolled in a ballroom dance class where we were initiated into the world of foxtrots, tangos, and the cha-cha. Each dance was taught to us in a sort of Morse code for the feet so that we could stumble along with a certain amount of accuracy or at least get our feet out of the way of our partners. Our instructor would chant, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow, or slow, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, depending on the dance. As it turns out, the key to successful dancing is to get the right sequence of the quicks and the slows. And it's kind of the same with our quest to grow spiritually. As I was studying for today's lesson on our final two fruits of the spirit, gentleness and self-control, I noticed that my favorite Newer Testament writer, James, teaches these two virtues as though they are steps in a dance, which they are really, so we will pair them together for our final lesson, dancing our way to the end of our summer series. Now, in order to dance, you have to hear the music, and James even emphasizes the importance of listening. He writes, you must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. As I made note of these three essential steps, I saw the pattern, did you? You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, quick, slow, slow. That's the pattern of this dance. It's the gentleness and self-control dance. You see, the foundation of gentleness is humility, and it is humility that makes us quick to listen to the ideas of others. The arrogant, the prideful, the not-so-gentle folk, they like to talk. They will often talk over others, and if they do let someone else speak, they do not really listen, for they are too preoccupied with forming their next argument. So to cultivate gentleness, the first step is be quick to listen, and the next two steps be slow to speak and slow to anger. Well, that's the definition of self-control, isn't it? We do not need to say the first thing that comes to our mind, nor do we need to explode with fury when we are provoked. James, brilliant teacher that he was, had some wonderful words about gentleness and self-control as they pertain to our words. And I would love nothing more than to share his advice with you, particularly in this season when we are dealing with two hot topics, rampant wildfires and a presidential election. This may be the most important chapter in the Newer Testament for such a time as this, so quickly let's listen to the words of James, who was thought to have been the brother of Jesus himself. This is the third chapter of his letter, directed at those who wish to become leaders or teachers in the faith community, but full of relevant advice for all of us who use words. I'll be reading from the First Nations version, which has a lovely poetry to it. My sacred family members, not many of you should become teachers of our spiritual ways, for you know that we who teach will face a stricter judgment. We all stumble on the path in many ways, but if we could keep our words from hurting others, we would be mature human beings able to aim our whole lives in the right direction. Those who put bits into the mouths of horses are able to move them in the direction they want them to go. It is the same with a canoe. Even when a large canoe is being pushed by strong winds, it takes only a small paddle to steer it where someone wants it to go. In the same way, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it boasts about great things. A large forest can be set on fire by a tiny flame, and the tongue is itself a flame of fire. The tongue is a world full of evil and spreads its poison throughout the body. The words spoken by the tongue have the power to set on fire the very circle of life itself, and its flames come from the valley of smoldering fire. Every kind of four-legged beast or winged one of the air and every reptile or sea creature can be tamed and have been tamed by human beings, but no one can tame the tongue. It is an evil that never rests full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the great spirit, our honored father, and with it, we curse human beings who are made in God's image. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My sacred family members, this should not be. 
Does both sweet and bitter water come from the same spring? Can olives and figs come from the same tree? Can a grapevine bear figs, my sacred family members? Not at all. And neither can salt water be used to make water fresh again. Are any among you wise and understanding? Then show it in the way you live, doing good from a humble and wise heart. But if your hearts are full of bitter envy and selfish desires, then stop boasting and speaking lies to cover up the truth about yourselves. This is not the kind of wisdom that comes down from the one above us all. Instead, it is from this world. It is unspiritual and of the evil one. For where there is jealousy and selfish ways, you will also find confusion and all kinds of evil at work. But the wisdom that comes from the one above us all is first of all pure, then peace-loving, gentle, full of mercy, and open to another's way of seeing and thinking. People with this kind of wisdom are like trees filled with good fruit. They have open hearts and nothing to hide. This wisdom will bring about a harvest of doing what is right because they are peacemakers planting seeds of peace. So much good stuff. The tongue is like a fire. It's true. The tongue can be gentle like a soft candle casting a sweet light upon a page of a lullaby we sing to a sleeping child, or it can get out of control and burn everything down. So with our words. Our words can be gentle and healing, but only if we have self-control. Without self-control, gentleness is overtaken by the galloping steeds of pride and passion. Remember the dance steps. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, quick, slow, slow. My husband and I never got to the level of excellence in ballroom dancing, mostly because we don't practice our steps and have forgotten most of them. But in the dance of gentleness and self-control, this passage from James has been our guiding wisdom and our marriage has survived nearly a quarter century for it. We've also tried to keep that same rhythm in our parenting dance. And I don't mean to say we've always succeeded in both marriage and parenting. We've had our missteps tripped and even fallen down a time or two, but the best thing about the gentleness and self-control dance is that when you make a wrong step, it can be corrected with another pattern. Quick, quick, slow. Be quick to apologize. And if your dance partner reciprocates by being quick to forgive, healing will happen, sometimes slowly, but that's okay. Repair is possible. I keep talking about gentleness and self-control as if they're a dance, but but really they are. You can't practice either of them without a partner, but sometimes dancers get into a rut because they only learn how to dance with one particular partner. When we were taking our dance classes, our instructor insisted that we switch partners several times in each lesson. That was not our favorite part of dance class. We were desperately in love and really just wanted to dance with each other, but we understood the logic. You only really know how to dance when you're able to partner with a dancer of any height or agility level. It's super awkward at first, but a great practice in humility and empathy. On the dance floor of life, the same is true. We often choose to limit our interactions with people who are like us, who share our interests and biases and mostly agree with us. Easy enough to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger when the conversational partner is saying what's already on my mind. But the spiritual fruits of gentleness and self-control won't ripen properly unless they are warmed in the sun of divergent opinions. I know this is not welcome news, but I do think that the best thing we can do to cultivate a deeper spirituality is to engage with people who challenge us Learning how to do this dance with grace and poise, no matter the partner. That's how Jesus did it. Once he had a little following, he could have stayed put and preached to the choir, but he left his comfort zone, venturing into the danger zones of Gentile cities, Samaria, and even the temple. Everywhere he went, he met with different ideas, even opposition. And while he was not afraid to stand up to injustice when he saw it, even shaking a whip not so gently in the temple to chase off those who were shamelessly exploiting the poor in that holy place. Mostly Jesus did a lot of listening. Like when he encountered a lone Samaritan woman at the well, fetching water by herself because maybe the other ladies looked down on her, he sat beside her and heard her story, withholding judgment and offering grace. When he came across an angry mob ready to throw stones at a woman caught in adultery, angry all by herself, he did not shout to be heard above the din. 
Instead, he knelt down in a posture of humility, made some marks in the dirt, distracting the mob's focus from the woman to the dust from which they were all made and to which they would all return. And when that crowd settled down enough to listen, Jesus calmly suggested that the only pure, only the pure and sinless should cast their stones at the woman. He did not shout at them, nor at her. No scolding was necessary, only a few gentle words, though inwardly he may have been shaking with indignation for any number of reasons. With self-control, he saved one person's life and kept many others from committing murder. Even in situations where Jesus himself was on the receiving end of disrespect, he showed gentleness and self-control and taught others to have it as well. Walking through the Samaritan countryside, some of Jesus' followers were offended when they were not treated with the courtesy they felt they deserved. Shall we ask God to punish these wicked people, they asked. No, Jesus said. No need for revenge or retaliation. We're not interested in controlling how people behave. Gentle your own demeanor. Show some self-control and let's move on. Jesus' followers were taught the lesson of humility, to see themselves as no more important than anyone else, even if they were in the Messiah's inner circle. That was a hard lesson. They even argued sometimes amongst themselves which one would get the glory, you know, the best seat at the table when Jesus rose to the heights they imagined. He let them know, firmly, but without ridicule, that their mission was not about how great they would become, but about how great their service to others would be. Humility was at the heart of discipleship and they had to rein in their own greed and their lust for power. This call to gentleness and self-control expressed so beautifully in James's letter to those aspiring to the Christian life is still a guiding principle for us today. If we would flourish in our spiritual life, if we would truly show the world what it looks like to follow Jesus, if we would bear good fruit in our lives, then we must become masters of the dance called gentleness and self-control. We can practice it in our homes, in our churches, in our friend circles, in the public sphere, even on the internet. Do the steps with me now. Quick, slow, slow. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Do this in remembrance of Jesus, our gentle shepherd, in whose footsteps we walk and even dance. Gentle shepherd, come and lead us, for we need you to help us find the way. Gentle shepherd, come and feed us, for we need your strength from day to day. There's no Stay gentle, my dear friends.